However, in the form in which the notion of pure insight first makes its appearance, it is not yet realized. Accordingly, its consciousness still appears as contingent, as single and separate, and its essence appears for it in the form of an end which it has to realize. It has to begin with the intention of making pure insight universal, that is, of making everything that is actual into a notion, and into one and the same notion in every self-consciousness. The intention is pure, for it has pure insight for its content, and this insight is likewise pure, for its content is solely the absolute notion, which meets with no opposition in an object, nor is it restricted in its own self. In the unrestricted notion, there are directly found the two aspects, that everything objective has only the significance of being for self, of self-consciousness, and that this has the significance of a universal, that pure insight is to become the property of every self-consciousness. This second aspect of the intention is a result of culture in so far as in this culture, the difference of objective spirit, the parts and the determinations which its, ju its judgments imposed on the world, as well as the differences which appear as natural predispositions have all been upset. Genius, talent, special capacities generally belong to the world of actuality. Insofar as this world still contains the aspect of being a spiritual animal kingdom in which individuals admits confusion and mutual violence cheat and struggle over the essence of the actual world. These differences, it is true, have no place in this world as honest espes. Individuality neither is contented with the unreal matter in hand itself, nor has it a particular content and ends of its own. On the contrary, it counts merely as something universally acknowledged, that is, as an educated individuality, and the, the, the difference is reduced to one of less or more energy, a quantitative difference, that is, a non-essential difference. This last difference, however, has been effaced by the fact that in the completely disrupted state of consciousness, difference changed round into an absolutely qualitative difference. There, what is for the I and other is only the I itself. In this infinite judgment, all one-sidedness and peculiarity of the original being for self has been eradicated. The self knows itself qua pure self to be its own object, and this absolute identity of the two sides is the element of pure insight. Pure insight is, therefore, the simple, imminently differentiated essence and equally the universal work or achievement and a universal possession. In this simple spiritual substance, self-consciousness gives itself and preserves for itself in every object the consciousness of this, its own particular being, or of its own action, just as conversely the individuality of self-consciousness is therein self-identical and universal. This pure insight is thus the spirit that calls to every consciousness, be for yourselves what you all are in yourselves, reasonable. Paragraph 537 is one of the longest in this, this short section, Faith and Insight, and it brings it to a close in a very important way that has us thinking both of the world of culture that we, we've come from and then you know moved out into with Faith and, and Pure Insight and the dialectic between those two, and where we're going, which is the concept or the, the notion, the begriff of Pure Insight, which is what Hegel is calling the Enlightenment, the Aufklärung, right? And he's going to devote a lot of discussion to the ins and outs of that in, in the section to come. As a matter of fact, Hegel takes that, at least in really the rationality of the world, but, but in particular Western rationality, as being one of the defining moments, part of uh, a movement that is still going on within Europe at the time that he himself is, is writing and it's playing itself out. Um, so how do we get there? This, this notion of, of pure insight that you know, Hegel is, is spelling out, he says it's not yet realized. So what is it going to take for it to actually be realized? What does it mean to be realized to begin with? It means for it to be made wirklich, actual, to be made part of the world. And one of the hallmarks of Hegelian philosophy, in fact, the slogan 
that um, a lot of people will associate it with is the real is rational and the rational is real. That really fits in here with what is, is happening in this paragraph, the dynamic that Hegel's talking about. But it should be amended to say the real should be rational, the rational should be real, because until we get to the final state of the Hegelian dialectic, which is debatable about you know, whether we actually really did reach it the way Hegel thinks, um, we can't say that, that this has been fully worked out. So what we have here is a moment where Hegel is describing precisely what it would mean for the rational to be real, but for the rational to become real, which means that it has to rationalize everything else. It has to bring everything else within the scope of reason and not just reason, but spirit. So Hegel says in the form, which the notion of pure insight first makes its appearance, we're going to see this pure insight being played out in, in throughout the entire next section. Insight is going to come up over and over again. So we've only introduced pure insight. We haven't fully worked out what pure insight is. He says in the, the, the form in which the notion makes its uh, appearance, it is not yet realized. So what does this mean? He says, accordingly, its consciousness still appears as contingent, as single and separate. And its essence appears to it as an end. And the end is all this over here. The end is a universal, something outside, something beyond, something transcending the mere individual. But actually, reincorporating the contingent individual and all the other individuals, at least in principle as well. Now we should dwell for a moment on what exactly we have in mind in talking about the contingent individual. How does this fit in with the historical process as Hegel sees it playing itself out, leading up to an actual historical movement of the Enlightenment? I, I've mentioned in the past that we can look at this entire discussion of faith and pure insight as applying to you know certain parts of the middle ages but primarily applying to the early modern period um, particularly you know from from we could think about what happens in the reformation and all the different you know dialectical advances going on there which, which Hegel doesn't talk much about and then think about what happens in the criticisms of religion, the reinterpretations of religion. So who would this contingent individual be? Well, it might be Thomas Hobbes. It might be Bishop Barclay. It might be Benedict Spinoza. It might be Rene Descartes, who is telling us uh, that theology can have its domain because that is so far above us and we're going to stick with metaphysics and you know the things that come from it turning back to the world with mechanics, medicine, and morals, right? There could be all sorts of individuals who are contingent individuals. They are part of what we nowadays call a culture war. And quite often, they are the lone sentry stationed up on the hill who can surveil the enemy forces far below, realize that they're surrounded, and yet try to make a stand as best as they possibly can. So the contingent individual has a goal, a goal of realizing something that they themselves experience, something that they themselves have as part of who they are, an integral part, this pure insight, but now for others. So he says, its essence appears for it in the form of an end. Its essence is outside of itself. Its essence is over here in the form of an end which it has to realize, it has to produce, it has to bring about. So it, he says, it has to begin with the intention of making pure insight universal. Now, what does this mean? Hegel is going to tell us that this has to do with making everything actual into a notion. Let's make it a little bit more concrete. What was Rene Descartes, in effect, doing 
with his meditations, his discourse, which was an introduction to three parts of his unpublished The World. He, he suppressed the publication of it after the Galileo incident. What was he doing with his principles of philosophy? What was he doing with all the correspondence that he carried on? He was attempting to lead people to use their unaided reason, a well-regulated reason, to understand the world themselves, society, God, the universe, in a different way. In a way that would be certain, that would uh, have to do with clear and distinct ideas, putting them together in, in a systematic way. Which is what you see, for example, if you ever do read his Principles of Philosophy. Most people only read the Discourse and the Meditations, but the Principles are really where the, the core stuff is. And Descartes is, is, is really a great representative of this because he writes in the vernacular for some of his works. That, you know, For example, the Discourse on, on Method is written in French. Why? Because as opposed to the meditations written in Latin, which were only accessible to men and scholars, he says, well, the discourse can be read by women who probably don't read Latin, although he actually did have some Latin correspondence, right? Princess, uh, Latin writings and, and reading correspondence like Princess Elizabeth. Um, and common people. Descartes has the ambition that we see in the early modern period leading into the Enlightenment of taking that, that pure insight and making it something accessible, something available to everybody, and thereby changing the world in the process. Now, Hegel frames this in terms of making everything that is actual into a notion. That means that everything has to be brought within the scope of philosophy, or it, it, it is cast outside of it as something irrational, absurd, uh, un, unessential, right? So the essential, whatever is essential, can be turned into notions, can be turned into uh, begreffe. And this could be notions in the sense of, you know, just ideas, or it could be notions in the sense of a systematic philosophical approach to things, which is what we see so many projects carrying out at this time. You know, it's very important when we think about the history of philosophy to actually read not just the, the you know, one or two works that we get assigned in, an, in a modern philosophy class, but to read across a person's corpus. You don't really know what Thomas Hobbes is up to if you only read portions of the Leviathan. You need to also read some of his correspondence. You need to understand that he was engaged with René Descartes in a rather unproductive exchange. You need to read the uh, uh, other treatises. You need to also read the Behemoth. Similarly, if you're going to you know, study Spinoza, don't just read the Ethics. Also read the you know, Tractatus Theologico Politico. Uh, because there's so much involved there. Likewise with Descartes, you should, you should read more. And not to mention David Hume or John Locke. You know, portions of the essay concerning human understanding and the second treatise of government, they're great, but he wrote a lot more. The letter on toleration, for example, very short work, but very important for Locke's, for understanding what Locke's project was. Or his, you know, uh, works on education. So we can say, um, making everything that is actual into a notion, and now notice what he says, into one and the same notion in every self-consciousness. This also is, is rather key. What we see in modern philosophy, and what we see really in, in the entire scope of letters that are affected by the, the turn to modern philosophy. So I would say literature, I would say uh, even the theater, um, also history, is this emphasis on things must be made intelligible to all. That is a hallmark. This is what we see Descartes, for example, using as almost like a weapon or a battering ram to, to knock down previous ways of, of looking at things. Thomas Hobbes uses the same, uh, same approach. So does Locke. And um, he says, one and the same notion in every self-consciousness, we're going to be looking at the field of everybody. Everybody is, is, at least theoretically, 
able to partake in this. That's the goal. That's the end. Definitely not realized, not even realized in our own time, but that is what pure insight at this point in time is dreaming about. That is the great uh, project, you might say, of the enlightenment that we're soon going to be looking at. So now he says, this intention is pure because it has pure insight for its content. Why does that make it pure? Couldn't pure insight have an ulterior agenda? Well, pure insight is operating very much as, you know, this is a typical Hegelian dialectic, as has all these other shapes of consciousness before it. It is firmly committed to its point of view and it's going to work it out. If pure insight really was just kind of a partisan project deployed selectively to attack opponents, it really wouldn't be pure insight. It would be motivated insight. It would be interested insight. Pure insight is able to have the dialectical weight and make the advances that it does precisely because it is pure insight and it's going to end up turning on itself as we're going to see. So he says the intention is pure, for it has pure insight as its content, right? The Absicht has Einsicht for its content. And this insight is likewise pure, for its content, he says, is solely the absolute notion. The absolute notion. The unrestricted. Nothing else standing in its way. As Hegel describes it here. It meets no opposition in an object. It, it, It can cover everything. Philosophy, and this is something I think that a lot of people have lost sight of in the contemporary philosophy of our own time. Philosophy at one time had the ambition of reaching out and understanding and integrating everything. We see this still as a a conception of philosophy in the 19th century and even in parts of the 20th century in various traditions of philosophy. Philosophy is the field that should in fact try to extend itself to everything, all of its others, everything that is opposed to it. If it doesn't do so, if like, you know, what happened in analytic philosophy, it sort of, you know, shrinks itself in and says, oh, that's, that's for the sciences and that stuff over there is, you know, I'm thinking about, you know, logical positive. That's nonsense because that's ethics and, and religion. We're just going to do this little logical analysis here. That ceases to be philosophy from Hegel's perspective, and from the perspective of so many other philosophers, including those of the moderns, even the ones who appear to be skeptical, even the ones who appear to be careful and say, oh, I'm just, you know, a laborer like Locke, you know, clearing away some of the rubble. Read Locke's works and you see that is definitely not the case. He has ambition for philosophy to try to cover as much as possible. Even Immanuel Kant, who in a certain way might be viewed as one of the most skeptical of philosophers, because he takes the the noumenon you know and casts it way uh, behind the the veil of phenomena that will will never actually get to it he himself has the ambition of applying philosophy to everything uh, you know great example is religion read you know religion within the limits of reason alone it's an ethics treatise it's not a treatise about religion at all so hegel goes on we go on with hegel rather and he says uh, the absolute notion is it meets with no opposition in an object, nor is it restricted in its own self. This is really integral to philosophy as well. Philosophy is supposed to be reflexive. It is supposed to ask questions not only about everything else, but also of itself. It's supposed to try to encompass everything. And if it doesn't uh, encompass everything, it can ask at least the question, why can't I understand this? So he goes on and he says, in uh, the unrestricted notion, there are two aspects that are found. Everything objective has only the significance of being for self, of self-consciousness. And this has the significance of a universal. That pure insight is to become the property of every self-consciousness. The world is now understood as a world for subjects, for self-conscious subjects. And every single one of them is to become aware of this. Again, a dream that has not been realized fully. uh, and, And probably we can never point at a time where even, say, half the people 
uh, were living in the way that the the uh, person of pure insight, the person who is at that gestalt, you know, that that shape of consciousness, is envisioning. But this drives historical development. And here we're starting to move to look at the realm of culture and what is occurring there. So he says the second aspect of the intention is a result of culture insofar as in this culture, the difference of objective spirit, the parts and the determinations which judgments opposed on the world, as well as the differences which appear as natural predispositions have all been upset. So the, the sort of self-contradiction of culture and the sophisticated individual caught within it who engaged in the witty repartee now finds something else, now has opened the door to the person of insight who looks at that culture and says, we want something better for people than this morass, this, this mess. We don't want to just be like the naive individual who thinks that we can go back to an earlier stage of culture. No, we have to move forward. So he says, all of these differences, genius, talent, special capacities, these belong to, he says, the world of actuality. Insofar as this world contains the aspect of being a spiritual animal kingdom. Now, this is a, this is a, a frame of reference that we have used before, and we're coming back to again. What is a spiritual animal kingdom? Let's remind ourselves of that. The animal kingdom is, you know, this, this sort of highest organization of life, and you've got all these different species, and they're all related in, in different ways. And at the same time, there's really no meaning. To it. It's just a, a mishmash of all sorts of things that have happened to have evolved or developed or have been created, whatever metaphysics you like. There's no intrinsic rationality to it. We can look at things and say, okay, it's rational the way that this, this set of bones are articulated, but that's us, the rational subjects, looking at it. We've, we've already talked about this with the reason section. The spiritual animal kingdom has to do with human beings. Why is that guy a butcher, that guy an iron worker, that guy a ruler, that guy a scholar? You know, uh, where is everybody else? How do they end up in these roles? Seems to be rather contingent. Everyone does their thing. And we have this giant sort of organism or cosmos of, of whatever you want to call it, the political community, the city, the society. Everybody doing their thing within it. But it doesn't have any movement towards something more, something of value, something of of universal value. So he says these differences, uh, well, the, the spiritual animal kingdom is one in which individuals admits confusion and mutual violence, cheat and struggle over the essence of the actual world. They do all try to strive for what they view as important. Wealth, power, you know, social prestige, uh, getting to have sex, uh, you know, other pleasures, avoiding pains, uh, living in a, you know, house on a hill, whatever, whatever floats your boat, you might say, right? All these people, you know, imagine sort of a whole bunch of people swarming all over each other like an anthill, but at least an anthill has organization. This is just ants gone crazy. Hegel says, well, that is what, you know, culture is like, at least from the perspective of pure insight. Because these differences, he says, have no place in this world as honest species. Individuality neither is contented with the unreal matter in hand itself, the, the Zaka Zelps that we talked about, uh, nor has it a particular content and ends of its own. Now, this is really interesting. On the contrary, it counts merely as something universally acknowledged. Individuality in order to be valued as individuality, requires some recognition in a universal way. Now notice that at this point, Hegel is no longer talking about just recognition. I need recognition from the other, and this one single other will suffice. Now he's saying it needs recognition from the society, from the universal. This doesn't necessarily mean from every single person, but from what is really essential in it. 
So he says, the, these differences are reduced to one of less or more energy, a quantitative difference, a non-essential difference. What are these differences? Well, let's think again. Genius, talent, special capacities. If you happen to have you know, more capacity for one thing and I have more capacity for another, those are merely quantitative differences. They don't affect the fact that we're all capable of this pure insight, which should be universalized throughout the society. All those other things that fit in here with the spiritual animal kingdom, those don't really matter that much. They're, they're differences that don't really make a difference. It's sort of like you know, uh, asking, listen, I need to take an Uber to get myself to the, to the train station. And you know, the car pulls up and you're like, oh, that's a red car. Who cares? It doesn't matter. What matters is, is that car going to get you to the station? It's a two-seater, it's a four-seater. It's a convertible. Well, okay, that would matter a bit, you know, for win winter here in Wisconsin. But most of these differences do not make a difference. They have an air freshener. The car smells bad. Who cares? You're getting out of the car and getting on that train. Similarly, we can say, uh, you know, that about all these other traits that, that we think make a person who they are. Or these things that they happen to have at a certain time within the spiritual animal kingdom. This guy's in charge. Well, you know, wait a couple weeks, somebody else will be in charge. Or go over there and, and talk to that person because they're in charge. These things are non-essential differences from Hegel's perspective. He says, um, this last difference has been effaced by the fact that in the completely disrupted state of consciousness, difference changed around into an absolutely qualitative difference. What is the qualitative difference? That of faith and insight. And insight is where we're looking at this point. He says, there, what is for the eye and other is only the eye itself. Should we see here what we call an effacement of alterity in Hegel, something he's been accused of so many times, you know, not treating the other as the other. This is only a transitory stage. Each of us gets to realize that the other is an other I. This is something that was there in the self-consciousness section, right? And back then it led to conflict. Now it doesn't actually have to lead to conflict. Now it can start to lead to reconciliation or to integration. If I awaken in another person the pure insight that is available to them, and I, in, in doing so, you know, realize that they are another I who is not truly other to me, but is actually like myself, I'm not hurting them in the process. I'm not making them less what they are. I'm actually allowing them to be what they are. And it's reversible. I could be the one over here that Spinoza or Descartes or whoever uh, enlightens about this, this sort of stuff and then pass it on to another person. So he says, the self knows itself, qua pure self, to be its own object. And this absolute identity of the two sides is the element of pure insight. This is what allows us to have this communicative relationship. I can make an argument to you. I can provide you with evidence. And you can say, ah, yes, I do grasp that. Or wait a second, what about this? And in, in that wait a second, what about this? I am myself being treated as another I to your I who is engaging in pure insight. And this is how pure insight actually functions. It's not the property of just an individual. It's something that is supposed to be made social. So he says, pure insight is therefore the simple, imminently differentiated essence. And equally, now notice what he says here. This is really interesting. The universal work or achievement, and a universal possession. That's worth dwelling on. The universal work or achievement and a universal possession. In laboring for oneself within the field of pure insight, the way that modern philosophers did, they created something, some things that lasted beyond themselves, that were intended already for publication, uh, for dissemination, for allowing other people to do something with their minds, do something with their lives, do something with their societies in relation to others. They may not have had the perfect recipe 
in every case. Maybe we reject Cartesian dualism or we say, well, Leibniz was wrong about this or Locke was wrong about this. But the guiding impulse, the spirit behind it, the absolute uh, notion that's driving it is one that Hegel thinks can be shared and passed on, can become a universal work or achievement, universal possession. So he says, in this simple spiritual substance, self-consciousness gives itself and preserves for itself in every object the consciousness of this its own particular being or its own action. And then he says, conversely, the individuality or self-consciousness is therein self-identical and universal. This is a way of making oneself universal. And now notice how he ends this. And this is leading us right into this section of enlightenment. This pure insight is thus the spirit that calls to every consciousness. Be for yourselves what you all are in yourselves, reasonable. We're all reasonable in ourselves, but we have to realize that for ourselves, which means realizing it not only in, in a reflexive relation to our own selves, but in relation to others as well. And understanding ourselves as not mere particular individuals, though we don't want to lose sight of that, but as part of something larger, something universal. 